Hello, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Somebody sent me this, and uh, you know who you are. And uh, I didn't change a, a thing, so I thought, I'll do it. It's called, uh, The Veil is Removed. Now, in modern usage, today, a veil could be one of two things. It could be like a curtain, which separates one part of a room from another, or uh, brides often wear veils over their face. So, keep that in mind. In the book of Exodus, in chapter 26, verses 31 and 33, we're going to read, And thou shalt make a veil, like a curtain, and thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of of the testimony, I'm talking about the Ark of the Covenant, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. Now the holy of holy was uh, only allowed to be gone into one time a year, and that was the high priest. And according to legend, I guess you could say, they would tie a rope around his ankle when he went in, and if God was not pleased with him, he would kill him. And then they would have to drag his dead body out with the rope. Because if you went into the Holy of Holies and you weren't the high priest, you were a dead man. I mean, that's just, you know. Uh, but uh, they would offer, from what I understand, blood on the Holy of Holies. So the veil is hung and the Ark of the Testimony is placed on the inner side of the veil and divides the most holy place from the holy place. Then in Exodus, uh, let's see, in the verse 34, we read, And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy place. So, and the mercy sit, seat sits on top of the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy place. Now, personally, my opinion is that the, uh, the mercy seat in the New Testament would be called the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if you're not in Christ, well, then you're at the white throne judgment. That's where all the wicked will appear at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, when um, sometime in that time frame. But the, uh, so let's read a little, just a little bit about the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, that verse right there kills soul sleep, if you ask me. How can we be present with the Lord if we're waiting for our resurrected bodies? Verse 9, Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Accepted of him who? Accepted of being accepted by Christ. Verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's only the... Uh, Paul's talking to believers here. He's not talking to everybody. That's where people get messed up. They think they read something in the Bible that only applies to the Christians, and then they apply it to everybody. No. Those that are not in Christ are going to be at the white, uh, the white throne judgment just before they are thrown into the lake of fire. So, for we, Christians, 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See, we're going to be judged by our works. Our salvation is being born again of the Spirit by our, and our faith in Christ. But, our, but the things that we're going to receive is going to be the things that are works. Verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciousness. Consciousness. All right. So, um, all right. So the mercy seat would sit upon the top of the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy place. Now, this is the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Um, in Exodus twenty-seven twenty-one. In the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. Now, Aaron was the brother of Moses. They were of the tribe of Levi. They were the Levitical priesthood. They were the ones that served the Lord. They were the ones that the tithe was to support. The, the 11 tribes were su to pay a tithe to support the, the, the Levites. So unless your uh, pastor at a church can prove that he's a Levite priest, he has absolutely no authority to be preaching about tithes. He's a fraud. Jesus didn't say anything about tithes. All right. Exodus 30 and verse 6. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. See, the veil was to, it was like a curtain. It was to separate us unclean sinners with the Holy of Holies. All right, so, within the most holy place where the Ark of the Testimony is, with the mercy seat on top of it, is where God meets with Aaron, his sons, and the Levite priests after them. And uh, when Moses came down from the mount, mount, you know, when he got the Ten Commandments, from being with God for 40 days and 40 nights, didn't Jesus fast for 40 days and 40 nights? Wasn't the, um, the um, flood of Noah 40 days and 40 nights? You know, that, that, that comes up quite a few times. All right, so when Moses came down from the mount, from being with God for 40 days and 40 nights, the skin of his face shone, and the people were afraid. So he put a veil over his face. See, his skin glowed. I mean, it was like, you know, I guess it was like a light bulb or something. I don't know. Exodus 34, verse 35. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. The veil here represents the veil that divides the holy place from the most holy place. Moses was like God to the Israelites, not the Israelis. So Moses was like God to the Israelites, for God spoke face to face with him, and he was to relate the messages to his people. But the people could not look upon Moses' face without the veil. And when you think about it, In the Old Testament, Moses was the go-between between the people and God. Well, when Christ came, now he's the go-between between God the Father and the sinful creation. So you've got God the Son, well, they'll say the Son of God, as our go-between. So, 
Exodus 34, verse 33. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. All right, so uh, verse 34. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out, and he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. All right, so, but when Moses went in to speak to God, he didn't need the veil, and he took off the veil to speak to God. Uh, in Ver Leviticus chapter 4, verse 6, And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. Now, people... Uh, I want to make a quick thing here. I forgot to mention it. The uh, In Exodus 26, verse 31, uh, the first verse I read, it says, And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twisted linen of cunning work with cherubim shall it be made. Uh, if you take a good look at the, the whore, the harlot, of Revelation, of Babylon. And it talks about the colors of the whore. Well, it's the same colors as the temple. The, I mean, the well, the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. Same colors. Scarlet. Okay, so... All right, so... All right, so back to Leviticus 4, verse 6. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood, because you couldn't go to, to the Lord without blood. That's why Christ shed his blood on the cross. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. That's Leviticus 4, 6. Now, in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 13, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Okay, so to the end of that which, excuse me, which is abolished, which is the Mosaic law of animal sacrifices and shedding of animal blood, for the remission of sin. Now, I've had people tell me that all the law was nailed to the cross. I'm sorry, the Ten Commandments were not nailed to the cross. Christ is our Sabbath, but if you want to take a day, uh, the seventh day off and uh, not work and honor the Lord, I think that's a great thing and reflect upon the great things that Christ and God the Father have done for us you know, and do Bible studies and what have you. I think that's great. Uh, do I think that if you don't keep the Sabbath, you're going to hell? No. Christ is our Sabbath. But I'm sorry, I don't think the Ten Commandments were done away with. Matter of fact, uh, Christ made it even more tough. He said, if you just looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. I mean... You know, boy, I mean, how many guys uh, haven't uh, looked at an attractive female? I think God definitely knew what he's doing when he created the female. But Christ said, love the Lord and love thy neighbor. And on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. So basically, the Ten Commandments all fit into those two all right, so, and I'm sorry, I don't, like I say, I don't think the commandments were done away with. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And Jesus said that in John 14 and verse 15. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So, all right, so, 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 14, we read, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. You see, the Israelis, Jews, don't believe in Jesus. The veil is Jesus. They are still waiting for their Messiah. And guess what? God the Father is going to send them the Messiah that they so eagerly await. Jesus told the unbelieving Jews in John 5, 43, he said, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Well, guess what? They're going to receive their Messiah. I forget which rabbi. Somebody sent me a video. You know who you are. About the, uh, the rabbi that was basically degrading everything that Christians believed. And basically was telling everybody, well, everything that the Christians believe, uh, believe the opposite. Because they're wrong. Um matter you know there they said that uh, Jesus is the anti messiah and theirs is going to be the true messiah and of course they're going to rebuild the temple uh they want to i believe they will some people are disagree with me that's all right but there's two big groups there's the temple mount uh faithful and the temple institute Two big Jewish groups, and they want to rebuild their temple for their Messiah. And honestly, I, I, I think God the Father will allow it. But, you know, I could be wrong. Hey, I don't know it all. I'm just some Joe that uh, reads the Bible too much. What can I tell you? Well, I, I don't think I do enough, but uh, some people say I do too much. Uh, so... In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you know, it says, But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Uh, verse 16, Nevertheless, when it, shall, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So the veil is taken away when our Father reveals Jesus to them. Then they can see God face to face as Moses did when he removed the veil to talk to God by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And that's in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. Through the veil, his flesh. Now think about this. In Matthew 27, 51, we read, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. So the earth shook, the rocks broke, and the veil, the curtain of the temple, was rent. It was ripped in two from the top, heaven, to the bottom, earth. All right, in John chapter 3 and verse 13, we read, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. You see, Christ came from heaven to earth, and then he went from earth to heaven. So now, does that make sense in Matthew 27, 51? And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. So the veil on the temple that separated the holy from the most holy, where the Ark of Testimony or Ark of the Covenant was kept, was torn down when Jesus died. His blood had been sprinkled before outside. The veil now, as he died on the cross, now he who is in Christ, doesn't need the veil, but can 
see God face to face. Well, figuratively speaking, right? All right, Hebrews 6.19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. Thank you, Father, for we now enter within the veil. All right, and in Hebrews 9.13, I'm sorry, Hebrews 9, verse 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. Now, gold is a very interesting metal. Now, I, I, this is my opinion. I believe that gold is, as a metal, is representative of God. I mean, G, it's spelled G-O-L-D. If you look at, take God and put, you know, put it in gold, you have to put an L in there. But, but the thing is, gold doesn't tarnish. And I believe that those in Christ are likened unto silver. And silver can tarnish. But when silver is pure, it and smooth, it's like a mirror. So that when God looks at the silver, he can see his reflection. But, uh, you know, we were made out of the dust of the earth. But yeah, you could do a big study. You could do a study on uh, metals in the Bible. I, there's, I think there's a lot more important things to for me to do, but uh, maybe one day I'll do that. All right, so, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that but budded and the tables of the covenant. See, in the Ark of the Covenant, there was a manna, Aaron's rod that budded. I think it was the rod that uh, he threw down with Pharaoh, and the um, the Ten Commandments. So where's the uh, Ark of the Covenant? I don't know. I I kind of wonder if they rebuild the temple, uh, if they will fake one, and claim to find it in Ethiopia. I I don't know. I don't know. I I kind of that's kind of my opinion. I mean, because if I was the devil, that's what I would do. I'd, I'd make one and then claim to, you know, wow, we found the Ark of the Covenant. Let's take it to the temple and then their Messiah can come. Verse 5. And over it, the cherubims of glory, overshadow, overshadow, uh, of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. By his own blood he entered once into the holy place. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh... How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And people, if you want to read the book of Hebrews, you should read it in conjunction with the book of Leviticus. Because that was the, the book for the Levite, the Levitical priesthood. And the book of Hebrews is the fulfillment of that. Matter of fact, 
uh, the book of Hebrews does not have an author attributed to it. Personally, I think Paul wrote it, but uh, I don't know. Because Paul was, uh, Paul was uh, taught the same as the priests were. I mean, he, he, he spent a childhood learning the things of God from the scriptures. So, and Christ took him, I think, for three years into the wilderness to learn. So, there you go. Maybe. I don't know. It's also interesting that at a traditional wedding, the bride stands before the groom with a veil over her face. And, you know, I used to do weddings. I've done a lot of weddings I feel guilty about doing. I shouldn't have done. But, uh... You know, I've, I can't understand uh, why, and I mean, I'm no better. I try not to be a hypocrite. But uh, I don't understand how a woman that's been with, you know, a couple dozen different guys wears a white dress with a veil over her face. I, I could never figure that one out. Uh, I did a wedding one time at a five-star hotel between the bride and the groom, they had seven marriages between them. I mean, really. And I'm a hypocrite, people. So, you know, I'm no better. Uh, you know, I try not to be a hypocrite. So, all right. So the, brands, the bride stands before the groom with a veil over her face. Once they are married, the groom lifts the veil and sees his bride face to face. Well, Guess what? Jesus is the groom. And he has lifted the veil from his bride's face, which is the church. His flesh, God in the flesh. And we can now see each other face to face. This is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. All praise and glory to our King of Kings, who is gathering the wheat to put in his barn, his sheep to put in his sheepfold, and his bride for that great supper where we will all drink. So at the great supper where we will drink new wine and forever be with him. Remember the, uh, the Lord's Supper where he took the bread and he took the wine and said, eat. This is my flesh, and drink this. This is my blood. Well, guess what? There's coming a marriage supper of the Lamb. And um, you know what's really sad is people that actually believe the pre-trib rapture think that they're going to be up in heaven at the Lord's marriage supper of the Lamb, and everybody else on earth is going to have to die for their faith and they're going to miss the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're going to miss it. I mean, really? You know, people that die for their faith are going to miss the marriage supper of the Lamb. I mean, they actually believe this stuff. Uh, so what can I tell you? All right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.